Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today on the bench is another barn find radio receiver. It's a 1960s, 1970s era AM FM radio with vacuum tubes inside it. So let's see if it works. I have no idea. If it doesn't work, we're gonna make it work. Not a big deal. So we'll tear the thing down any way we look at it and see how the thing works. So let's plug it in and see if there's any life and proceed from that point. All right, here it is in all of its glory. Nothing has been touched since the barn, as you can see, dust everywhere. And it's just sat on the shelf so that we can go through this thing together. So this is the back side here. The reason I know it has tubes in it is because of this right here. A little piece of it is missing. I'll just uh, zoom in on that for you so you can see the tubes. So I find it interesting that they just kind of scratched out some numbers and then stamped the replacements on here. Kind of an interesting thing that they've done there. You'd think it would just be cheaper to print a whole bunch of these things off with the correct numbers on them, but whatever. I guess the stamp worked. And uh, yeah, it's in relatively good condition for the incredibly hideous looking radio that it is. So uh, hey, if the thing works, all that much better. If not, I'll make it work and uh, who knows, this might just sit off to the side here in the lab and play some FM for me when I'm uh, working on stuff you know, on those quiet evenings. Who knows, whatever, right? So I could definitely use a cleaning, that's for sure. All right, so what I'll do is I'll get this thing plugged into the isolation transformer and variac supply. We'll turn it on, see what happens and go from there. Isolation transformer and current limited variac supply. This is plugged into it and this is in the off position. Both of them are. So I'll turn this on. So you should see a very dim glow on the bulbs, which means that this whole thing is working right now, but this is still off. So when I turn the switch on, these should get bright and then go down a little bit. So let's see what happens. Absolutely nothing. So that means that this radio has no life in it right now. So something is wrong inside here. So that gives us something to fix as well as tear down. So I'll shut this off. And let's get into this thing and find out what's wrong with it. To get inside this thing, it looks like we have to remove this screw, this screw, this screw, and this screw. And there are some on the bottom as well. So one here and one over there. So let's see what happens. It looks like the whole thing might just come right out of the front side. So let's find out all the original dust on this. So let's just remove these screws and see what's going on. So you can tell this is from the years when they started to take safety a little bit more seriously. They have an interlock <clears throat> on here like they did with the uh, televisions. And uh, oddly enough, they are using series set television tubes in this. So they're probably, again, a cost cutting method. And that's what it was all about way back when is, of course, selling a product that works and at the same time giving you what you want and them saving some money still about that nowadays except it's kind of changed to them just saving money and giving you junk that's what's going on nowadays it's really hard to find quality anything now so looks uh, not too bad inside right you know the original dust here and all that kind of stuff i like that uh, early circuit board design it looks nice a lot of people frown on these early circuit boards you know what they're still intact now and it's what 2023 right so let's remove these and see what happens all it can do is just make things easier right it'll be easy to identify because they got washers i don't know if this has ever actually been a part because most of the parts look to be here and let's see will it fall out and we still got this let's see what this does Does it come out of the back? Does it go to the front? What's going on with this thing? So this is all loose now. So it obviously wouldn't come out of the back because right, it would hit here unless it tilts. Oh, it does tilt. There we go. That was a good call. Hey, look at that. That was pretty easy to service. Nice to get into. So we've got a bunch of tubes here, one here. I don't know if you can see that. One down in there, one over here, 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 and over here in the FM tuner. 
So I will, <clears throat> I will get a plug. I guess I'll just leave that in there. I'll just leave this in here. I'll get another plug with some clips and I will plug it in and see if we have any glowing of the tubes, which I'm not thinking that we will because uh, the bulbs didn't change. So I'll get that underway and be right back. I have the radio now plugged into my isolation transformer and current limited variac supply with my little cheater cord here. You can see the two bulbs are lit up again. And the first thing I want to do is just move the tubes around in the socket just to see if they're you know, just a bad connection or anything like that first. So I'll just wiggle them around a little. Being careful not to touch anything other than the tube, the glass tube. Move that one around. That one. And I'm looking for, obviously, a brightness change in the bulbs, right? That's why the bulbs are in the shot here. Move this one around over here by grabbing a little glass tip on it. And there is no change. So that kind of tells me that there's either an open connection in here or one of the filaments is open. And that's what we need to look into next. All right, the supply is turned off, so I can just grab these and take that off there. Move that out of the way. So this looks like this is held together in a very interesting way. Looks like this has already been taken apart. Like this has actually been soldered to the top portion of the speaker, this copper type chassis. Usually it's copper plating. As, uh, looks like it's been soldered up here, but somebody's removed the solder, so obviously this has been out of the case. And it looks like it might be held by that one screw right there. And then of course the knobs on the front are going to uh, add to the fun of getting this apart, right? It was actually very easy. A little too easy if you ask me. Okay, so I'll grab a screwdriver here. Hopefully this will fit in there. It does. Remove that. So that's probably that there. Now I have to figure out how to get that. It looks like it's like some sort of an interesting clip. Maybe the reason that this is here is you can pop something in here to kind of pop that back. So let's see if that's true. It looks like it is trying to come out. It's not fighting all that much either. This might just be coming apart a little too easy. Usually there's a catch. It never lets you get away with stuff that easy. Uh, let's see. Something is kind of catching a bit. Hopefully you can see all that. I don't want to force this, right? Maybe stuff is can catching on the bottom. Now I have to be very careful because this here might actually have a charge on it. It looks like there is solid state rectification here, so I'll just move that down a little bit. That looks like a little solid state rectifier here, so a little diode. And uh, this could be charged up. I really don't know, so I want to be very careful around this area. It is trying to come out, but it is catching on something, which I don't know what it is catching on. Oh, it might be catching on this little clip right here. Let's see. It is. It's catching on that clip. There's a little piece of plastic inside there that's catching on that. So, let's see if I can get that clip out. These little brittle plastic cabinets are always a, kind of a scary thing. I don't want to crack the cabinet. Mind you, the radio really isn't a showstopper, is it? But, you know, let's see here. Very difficult to do this on camera. It's catching on something. There it is. You can see that there it's coming off. So I'll pop this in here, move that sideways a little bit without wrecking everything. Okay, maybe we'll have some luck now. Ha ha! Look at that success. All right. Hmm, looks like somebody's definitely been in here. All right, let's see if that is still holding a charge. 
If it is. Hey, I've got my Probe Master probes on my meter today. These are the best probes, I'm telling you. Okay, so let's see here. Try and fit all of this in. See if we have any charge on this. Is that fitting in there? It is fitting in there. Can is negative. And we are on DC. Look at that. 144 volts. 144 volts. And this is the danger with these things. So uh, give me one second and I'm going to go and grab my capacitor safe discharger and um, I'll show you how that works and I'll be right back. All right, here's the safe capacitor discharge box that I released on Patreon quite some time ago. All the plans to build this are up there. Now, depending on what direction I attach this, one of these LEDs will glow and there's an array in here that will discharge the capacitor safely. And when the capacitor has run out, the LED will stop glowing. So at least it'll be below the forward of the LED. See that light up? And that's pretty much out. So let's drain that off. And of course these are connected together, so it drained them both off. All right, so they're connected together through the circuitry. So there we go. So now I know that it's definitely safe to be working around. And that's the kind of stuff that you have to be very careful with with any electronics, it's old or new. The even new stuff has got very large capacitors in it. So we'll just check this again with a voltmeter. And as you can see, we're 0.9 of a volt. And through dielectric absorption, you can see that it's climbing again. So a lot of people think that capacitors are just self-charging. They're not. It's a thing called dielectric absorption. And this will read roughly the same, so 1.4. So in a case like this, a lot of the times it is good. This won't charge up very high, but what will end up happening is uh, you know, it'll end up coming to a certain level, which won't be too incredibly high, and it'll just sit there and kind of come back down again. So I can tap it one more time with the uh, capacitor discharge device. It's probably too low to make too much of a LED. Yeah, just a little bit of a flicker there. So one of the things to pardon the pun, rectify this problem, is to just short the capacitor out while in use. The only thing is, if you're concerned about that, this won't charge up very much anymore, but uh, if you're concerned about that, you can't forget to remove the short circuit before you try to power it up again. That's the only catch. And that was my voltmeter tipping over over there. So anyways, so uh, a very handy tool to have around. So this even has carry through leads on it. So uh, the capacitor discharge device has carry through leads that you can plug into a meter. So not only can you discharge it with the box, but if you're concerned, if you want to see more information than just LEDs, you can attach this right to your voltmeter of whatever you have, digital voltmeter, or analog voltmeter, or whatever, VOM, VTVM, and you can watch the, um, watch the LEDs go down. And you can actually see the voltage drop as well. So that's all part of this box. Now I myself, I don't use this very often. I just watch the LEDs until they extinguish and then keep the probe leads on for just a few more moments. And then uh, usually it's drained enough that I don't have to worry about it. So but that is a perfect example of a capacitor that stayed charged for quite some time. And this capacitor has got to be pretty good. At least one section in it is we know for sure because how long has this thing been unplugged now? And it's still 140 some odd volts on there. So that's, uh, that's doing pretty good. So um, I'm beginning to think probably open filament. So um, anyways, let's start testing some tubes. Let's start with the most common tube in the world, a 50C5. So 50 is the filament voltage. So the 50C5, the two first numbers are the, are the voltage that it takes to light this tube up. So let's pull that out of there. And that's an interesting looking tube socket. Not much of a tube socket there. I'll have to zoom in onto that in a moment and check that out. So now pins three and four on a tube like this will be the actual filament pins. So what we'll do is I'll just get this under the center here and try and 
show you what I'm talking about. So you always count this way from the index. So in the center of the tube is the index, this opening here. So you count one, two, three, and four. Three and four are the filament pins. So we should have resistance on these pins if that is any good whatsoever. So I'll put the focus back on the meter up here and I'll see if I can steady this up enough to get this all in here. So you got uh, one, two, three, and four. And we have resistance there, about 60 ohms, so no problems. So we know that this one here is okay. So we can put that back in, but first I want to show you this really odd tube socket. Now I'll just uh, zoom in on this. Look at that tube socket. It's like completely hollow underneath. There's nothing there. It's just a bunch of legs that seem to be standing up right off the printed circuit board. Maybe the filament pins are broken on the bottom. You know, that might be our actual problem right there, come to think of it. I think that filament pin is actually broken, and when I'm putting the tube back in, they're relying upon this connection on the bottom side of the circuit board, right here, to hold the pin steady on top. Look at the pin, if you, you know, the, uh, the connection. You see right here? Let's get this out of the way. Okay, I'll wiggle it from the bottom section here. I'll just uh, put the focus on that. Look at that, see that? That's why the tube isn't going back in because every time I put it in, this thing's pushing out of the way. So what I'll do, look at that, it's actually turned around in there. So that's definitely a bad connection. That might be the reason that the tubes aren't lighting up right there. I'm very tempted just to change that entire socket out, what a bad looking socket. I've never seen anything like that. I wonder if that was just a cost cutting method or something like that. See if I can get the tube in here straight enough to uh, actually hold that. Okay, so it looks like it's holding it. Now I know a lot of you are going to be saying, you know, oh that's dangerous for the vacuum tube to be putting solder on the pin of a vacuum tube or on the circuit board. While the tube's in the socket you risk harming the tube. No you don't. So I've done this so many times I can't count. So I'll put the focus back on that there. I'll heat up my soldering iron and I'll touch up these connections here and uh, we'll try it again. Maybe that is the only issue. We might need to go on the underside here and re-solder all the tube sockets. It's looking like a lot of the pins on this are cratered actually. You can see this one here is cratered right around there as well. So it looks like a part of the tube socket's actually broken away. I think that's what's actually going on with this. That's why it looks so strange. So maybe I should just replace the tube socket. But for now, let's just see if this will make things happen. It's kind of fun to do from the side of the camera. So let's see if that uh, brings us back to life. Attach the cheater cord again. I gotta remember after this. Again, if you were worried about dielectric absorption, this would be the time to, you know, remember to remove the short or you'd have some big issues. Okay, so let's see what happens. I'll back this out. And we'll take a look up here. Let's see if that's gonna fix our problem. Alright, so pardon the focus for just a moment. Now Let's uh, take a look at the bulbs here. I'll turn this back on and see if we get that bright and dim sort of thing happening. Here we go. No, not much. Maybe that didn't help much. Get rid of some lights down on the bottom here. Nope. No tube action down on the bottom either. So back down here again. And still nothing. So we, beyond that, we still have a bad tube. So that'll be the next thing. So let's keep on testing filaments. All right, back to testing filaments. So get rid of this. This is disconnected again. And uh, you know what? Just because I'm going to be poking my fingers around in here, I'll do this again real quick. 
see the little LEDs there. Gets rid of that. I don't have to worry about zapping myself. Okay, so we got uh, two diodes and a triode inside this tube. That's what's inside here. So we have a triode here, and we have a diode there, and a diode there. So we're probably using that. Uh, it's the uh, FM thing called an FM discriminator circuit, probably. Anyways, uh, so usually on these tubes, pin four and five are the filaments. So uh, on these tubes, so we got uh, one, two, three, and then four and five. So we need to be looking at the, at the meter for pins four and five. So we got one, two, three. Yeah, that was me touching the leads together. Ignore that. That's four and five. So one, two, three, four, and five. And it doesn't look like we have anything, do we? Let's see if we have anything to nine, anything to nine. Well, so let's just take a quick look inside the glass bulb here. Hopefully you can see that. So you got one, move this out about here, two, three, yeah, four and five. Those two pins right there, I'll just I'll try and hold this steady. So that there and that there run off to the filaments. That's pin four and pin five. And that's what I just tested. And this has an open connection. So this is a 14 GT8, so 14 volts, and then factory identification number and eight useful internal components. Or you know, sometimes uh, you can look at it as eight connections. So 14 GT8. So that's a pretty special tube. I'm going to have to go looking through my stuff to see if I have a 14 GT8 or some sort of equivalent. I recognize the design in the 6 volt series, but uh, not, in the, uh, not in the 14. So I'm going to go do some tube hunting and I will return. I spent hours trying to find this 14 GT8 in my tube stock and since I'm reorganizing everything in the shop, moving everything around and all my tube stock is all over the place right now, this is unobtainium. So I started doing some research about you know, crossing this tube to something very similar and I found that a 19 T8, right about there, a 19 T8 is very close. What's very important is the heater current is the same in order to make sure that all the filaments light evenly. So the heater current is the same. The voltage is just a touch higher, which is not a big deal from 14 to 19 volts, right? And we're not dealing with anything that's uh, going to be uh, an issue at all. In fact, it'll just make things run a little bit cooler, if anything. So anyways, this tube here, let's open the box up, see if it's the original. It is a Rogers tube. Oh, that's nice. I find a lot of people over time, they throw old tubes into the tube box and you find that you, you find an old tube in there. So this is a brand new tube. So this is the, uh, this is what a, a 19 T8 looks like inside compared to a 14 GT8. So there's two diodes in here and a triode within this shell right here. So the only difference is, is that internally they're wired a bit differently. So the triode, which does the amplification in this so that, uh, you know, we can get some audio out of this, which is the, you know, the preamp for this tube right here, that's all wired the same and one diode is the same. The difference is the other diode is completely different. So if I grab the paper here, so if we take a look at the 19T8, you can see we have one diode here. And then we have a diode plate here, which is one of those little plates right there, a diode plate here. And then the cathode that's, you know, common to those, both of those plates is this cathode here. Whereas on the original tube, we have two completely separate um, diodes with two completely separate cathodes. And then that's, again, completely separate from the triode itself. So I'm going to need to make this tube work with this circuit here, which shouldn't be too big of a deal. Basically, I'm going to be uh, adding another diode 
into this. So I'll, I'll probably, since this already has, you know, solid state components in it, it has a solid state rectifier and it also has a solid state detector diode right down in there, you can see. I'll just add two diodes into the FM mod. Uh, detector ratio detector circuit here and uh, that should make this thing hopefully operate as the next step okay so I still need to plug this thing in and see what happens and we'll experience that together since that's what this is all about so I'll get the line cord hooked up and everything all hooked up and uh, we'll plug the tube in and see what happens see if we can get any AM we should at least get AM I know for a fact we won't get FM with this tube until I put the diodes in all right, I've got the line cord attached back up again. And I guess what we should do is put that tube in. That would definitely be helpful, wouldn't it? So move this here. Put that in. And since I'm going to be moving some dials around, I should put some knobs on this thing, I guess. It'll make things a little bit easier. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at the Variac here. And we'll see what happens now when we turn this thing on. Okay, so we'll look up here. I'll turn on the Variac, make sure it's on current limit. So, okay, so there we go. And that's what it should do. You see it brightened up a bit there and then went down. So I'll just leave everything attached here. I'll turn the volume right up. Make sure the Variac is right up, which it is. Okay. Oh, also, just so you know, between the uh, last shot and this shot here that you're seeing has been a few days, just, uh, again, sorting things and moving things around in the shop, making more room to move stuff from lab number one, or the original lab, to this lab here. So I'm still moving stuff, and uh, it's very time consuming. So I've been down here and worked on some other stuff in, in between as well. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Oh, I do hear, I hear noise. Let's see, uh, where's it? Oh yeah, listen to that. Aha, we have life. Let's see what happens. Get my hand around here. Oh, there is a station in there. I'll get my arm out of the shot there. See if I can find anything down here. There isn't much. So the lab is uh, somewhat below ground here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get uh, a loop with my 369 antenna and just put a loop of wire across here and that should couple in some signals from the outdoors into this and we'll see how well this works. All right, so I've got the coaxial lead running up to my antenna connection which runs to the 369 antenna, which is an absolute fantastic antenna. So that there goes out to the 369 antenna, that switch. And uh, this is the uh, coax running from it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna short the coax I'll short it and I'll put that across the, uh, the bar antenna here and we'll see what happens, okay? So here we go. I'll zoom into this a little bit. So here's the, uh, so put this around the bar antenna. Do a single lane traffic getting by and this is backed up uh, the bridge all the way onto the Sea Island side of things. Expect delays from around Templeton, Rust Baker Way North. I'll just start East. tuning this. Oak Street Bridge, southbound Volkswagen. Leon, Ian Six Hundred, Shady, the on that. Well, you know that we got to remember a lot more. Six. So it's sounding pretty good. AM is working okay. No problems there whatsoever. Again, with the influence of a piece of shorted coax right over the end there. So basically making a, 
I don't know, half turn or something like that around this. So if I put a few turns, it would get all that much better. But um, at any rate, so that works okay. So let's see what happens if we uh, do FM. I'm not expecting anything to happen. Yeah, as you see, nothing's going to happen here. So there's nothing on FM. So what I'm going to do is I will get on the underside and I'll put some diodes on this and I'll show you what I've done and then we'll try it again. On the underside here is this little plate and of course, you know, out of the entire area on this radio, what I need to get to is under this plate. So I desoldered this. I've just stuck this on here to show you what I've done. So I desoldered this. And then what I did is I'll zoom on in. So I isolated a few pins. So I desoldered the solder here and I put some of this fibrous tubing around the pin so that it won't make contact with the tube pins. So these two vacuum tube pins are completely isolated from the traces. And what I've done is I've used two RF shot key diodes and put them in place of the diodes that would normally be inside of the tube. So one is actually bridged across the original diode in the tube. And then this one here is the one that was, you know, completely in the wrong area. And I should also mention, I said that there was two diodes in here. I should actually mention, technically, there is three with a common cathode. So that's this replacement here. So now what I need to do is uh, just put this back on. I think, yeah, that went that way. So it just fits onto those two posts, like so. By the way, the capacitor is safely discharged. I checked that before I went and did this because, uh, well, the capacitor is sitting right here. And I wouldn't want to be sticking my fingers across that if it wasn't discharged. So I'll just put this on. There's enough just to have a connection here. I don't even really need to solder this. I'll just uh, push this back on right now. And that's tight enough just to try this out and see how this works. Technically, I would say 90% of this printed circuit board should be reflowed. The soldering needs to be fixed up. It's just, you know, they're, they're all cratering. You can see little cratered joints all over the place here. One right there. And right around the tube pins, you can see that, how it basically has a crack all the way around it. All the vacuum tube sockets need to be resoldered and everything like that. At least if I go through and, uh, you know, do an entire restoration on this. And after we see what the FM sounds like, uh, we'll make a decision. Should we actually do an entire restoration on this or not? So uh, I'll leave that up to you. And we'll see how many of you say yes. And if you more of you say yes, then, uh, you know, the majority of the comments will... Uh, you know, go ahead and do an entire restoration on that. And that would require recapping and tuning and all that kind of stuff too. So um, anyways, so what I'll do now is uh, let's uh, hook this back up to the line again. And I will, I think we're good. So this is in the FM position, is it? It is. I'll move that around. That switch is sure crusty. Yikes. Okay, so hopefully that's going to be good. All right. And uh, I like to move the switches around a few times. I'll just turn on the uh, Variac. And uh, let's power things up and see if we have any FM action. Yeah, I like to cycle the switches. This needs contact cleaning and all that too. Uh, one of the things I really don't like is the way that they've done the dial string in this. I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, this is, they're really cutting costs with this radio. So they, they kind of went overboard in some areas and in other areas they're just completely cutting costs. I hear static. Hear that? That's just me touching the chassis bit. I hear FM. Turn that down. Now, I think a lot of the rock bands, not rock and roll, but the rock bands have gotten a little stale in the recording process, mm -hmm. and it's because it's just so easy to use this computer here and edit yourself to death and make it's it so working. It loses that soul that we... Sounds like it needs tuning, though, really bad and IF alignment. Roses on GNR's massive tour, which wraps up in the Pacific Northwest in October 6th, signed on KISM.com. Concert Connection, Gal Overdale Rock with you. Friday afternoon, 7 to 8 outside our studios, top of the world in Birmingham. This place of July holiday. So, FM is working. So, it did come to life with those two diodes and this tube. So, the 19T8 
is way more common than the 14 GT8, so that will definitely be left in there. And of course, I need to resolder all the stuff on the bottom and everything. So what do you think? It's alive. Do you think we should go through and uh, completely restore this and make it, you know, bring it back to normal again? Or do you think we should just move on to another project? This one here with me is kind of uh, an iffy thing. I'm kind of on the, on the fence with it. I could use this as parts. You know, it's got lots of useful parts in it. You know, uh, this tube socket would have to be replaced. That's, uh, that's absolutely horrible. Um, you know, the capacitors all have to be replaced, the, at least the, the non-disc type ones. Uh, would need a complete alignment, 455 KCIF and 10.7 uh, megahertz IF. And, um, you know, the ratio detector. And I'll show you what I mean about the dial strings. I'll give you the, the full tour here. See, uh, you see the dial string here, how they don't even have pulleys? You see the dial string is just, just rubbing there, so I'll move this along. Right? It has so much friction, it's actually moving this clip around. There's nothing moves here. The, the string is just rubbing that post. So as you can see, you know, a lot of cost-cutting methods, no dial light, right? This thing has, you know, no dial lighting at all, which is kind of odd, you know? They're still using, you know, decent components, you know, like, I mean, you know, the tuning condenser and the, the FM tuner in here might actually have, have had a license from somebody way back in the day. Let's see, yeah, right here, All right? So that might have been in the day, automatic frequency control. So, you know, there might, you can see it has a patent number on it and everything, so it has AFC in there. So, you know, they are using some things where they probably way back in the day had to pay licensing fees for and things like that. Westinghouse did maybe, you know. So, uh, all in all, it does work. So, uh, what do you think? Thanks for stopping by the lab today. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you are enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and subscribe and tap that bell symbol. That way you'll be notified as soon as I post a brand new video. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to many of my personal electronic inventions and designs, definitely check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the show more tab and I'll pin the link at the top of the comments section. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.